Hey guys. This is part 7 of what if Naruto died and became a hollow. Hit like and subscribe if you like this one and also please check the author in the description. Let's start. We are pain, that's all. We are God. Chapter 28, A Nuevo Hokage So, Senora Poro Grands, tell me why I should allow you to become the head scientist in my kingdom, he said formally to the nervous looking warm like a juches, while relishing in the intimidation he brought over other hollows. Even if that blank mask obscured any visible emotions that the hollow might be displaying, he could just feel the tension in the air. Maybe it was the fact that it was just the two of them in the throne room with no guards to save the weaker hollow should the emperor in front of him decide to attack. He was vaguely aware of the window behind him that he could use to escape, but even then. Naruto's recruitment process had taken the kingdom quite some time, as Waco Mundo wasn't exactly known for its brilliant scientists. Most of the hollows he had interviewed had abilities that gave them an advantage in the field of study, but they lacked the raw intelligence that was needed to truly strive. In Sale's case, he had both, and he was in fact a fairly brilliant researcher in his own right. The only question was, would it be good enough for the hollow in front of him? W.L. Naruto-sama We have gone over the necessary requirements and skills needed to take the position of head scientist in the Reino animal. I dabble mainly in biology, but I also have the necessary skills in chemistry and physics, Sale said, trying to persuade the fox Vasto Lord. Naruto looked contemplative but he rolled his eyes over to the side lazily. And you know exactly what I'm looking for, correct? He said in a bored tone, turning a half-lidded eye in Sale's direction. Might I add, sir, that even with the required skills, this entire endeavor is going to be very lengthy. What you are asking for is not going to be an easy venture, and with all the necessary construction needed, it's going to take even longer, Sale said. Oh, I'm more than aware of how long and difficult this process is going to be. Naruto replied, his expression now fully focused on the ajuchas in front of him. But time is not the issue here. I just need a researcher with a suitable pedigree to do this for me, and so far no one has been able to meet those qualifications. I'm hoping that you'll be able to change that. If you meet my expectations, you have all the time in the world to complete this project not to mention some of the other perks that you'll be receiving. Sale knew just what he was talking about. He would be equivalent to one of Naruto's four generals, and would be given free reign over anyone lesser in rank than himself, that of which was everyone in the Reino animal save for five other hollows. What that meant was that he could basically do anything he wanted to them, within reason. I've made my decision, Naruto shouted, jolting Sale from his thoughts. You may know this already from the other scientists in my kingdom, but there's a very specific test I give to those looking for the position. Sale stared at him in confusion. You see, it's because of the test's insane difficulty that I have yet to find myself a head scientist who can supervise and perform my orders to their fullest extent. However, if you can pass this test, then I will trust you with anything and everything related to science and technology. The fox explained. What do I have to do, Naruto-sama? It's simply, really. Simple yet challenging. You see, around the time I formed this kingdom, I came into the possession of one of the bolus de evolution, which would allow us hollows to blur the boundaries between Shinigami and Hollow, and effectively become Erenkar. However, the secret to Erenkarization is not so easily cracked. The procedure is intensely complicated and difficult to understand. So, my task for you is this. Unravel the methods of Aaron and duplicate the effects in your lab. I'll throw in a little advantage. My treat. Unlike past competitors, you have all the time you need to complete this research, as you'll be staying here and working on it in our own personal facilities. See to it that you don't fail my expectations. He finished his sentence in a low undertone, any pretense of amiability completely gone. His visage was now set on a grim, Serious look, and Sale found it hard to look away from the Vasto Lord. The researcher bowed deeply, allowing his wings to go limp as he held one of his wiry appendages to his chest. He raised one eye underneath his mask to look at the king, who was getting off his throne and walking towards the right, 
where the apparent bola de evolution was being displayed. The bookcase behind the well-guarded display was where the emperor was headed for, as he grabbed an apparently ancient tome, and a thick stack of notes, almost as long as the book itself. This is El Libro de Ciclos, written by the legendary Hollow Reporo, who launched a nearly successful attack on Soul Society. This book contains many secrets that I have taken quite the interest in. But the only section in this tome you need to worry about is the one on Aaron Carisation. And that is where these come in, he held out the stack of notes to sail. The El Libro de Ciclos does in fact explain how to arancarize, but what the other scientists have discovered is that the book only explains arancarization through the context of that ancient kingdom. It was over a thousand years ago, after all. In addition to being incredibly complex to figure out, the hollow species as a whole has evolved since then, so the methods of arancarization used during the time of the kingdom will no longer work today. Naruto explained. Your task is to use these notes, and what's inscribed with the book to figure out a reliable method for arancarization that can be replicated. You're pretty lucky. I'm giving you all the time you need, plus you have all the resources left behind by hollows that took this test before you. I hope you won't let me down after putting so much faith in you, Naruto said with a hint of threatening in his voice that wasn't difficult to pick up on. Sale took the stack of notes from his employer leafing through the pages lightly while trying to get a general gist of what was going on here. His eyes narrowed underneath his mask, noting the many complex mathematical equations that littered the margins. The institution for research is a big, rectangular building dead ahead after you exit the tower. Honestly, you can't miss it. Talk to one of the scientists there to learn about the rules and procedures for it. Sale nodded. If you'll allow me to take my leave then, he said bowing lightly to Naruto. Naruto nodded, and Sale clutched the leaflet of notes in his hands, determined to get to the root of this problem as soon as possible. He walked out of the throne room, shutting the large door behind him as Naruto stared him down. Naruto really had to hand it to Sale. He did it. The rising scientist managed to produce and replicate a suitable method to harness the full power of the Bola de Evolution. In other words, they had cracked the secret to arancarization. It had taken nearly twenty years, with many tests and experiments needed to reproduce the full extent. Apparently, it was much more complex than even Naruto gave it credit for. Seo was just lucky he had an infinite amount of time to complete his test, even with all the other candidates for the position taking the same test while he did. But even still, his plan was far from over. Even with the secret to arancarization unlocked, there were still many things that needed to be accomplished. They needed to take more territory for one thing. Materials and other resources were scarce, and he needed it for the construction and the tools necessary for sale to work his magic. Even arancarization had to wait. Although it was simple to turn some of his soldiers into arancar, it had to be delicate on a personal level. Arancarization was a big thing after all and he wanted to be at the strongest he could possibly be when he arancarized. As much as he hated to admit, he wasn't at the peak of his condition. Although he was a vast lord, there was still much more room for improvement. To top it all off, he could no longer just gain strength through eating hollows. At this stage in his development, the only way to get stronger was to do old-fashioned training. Speaking of Sale, the new head scientist of the kingdom was currently stationed in his throne room going over the various procedures necessary for arancarization. And so, arancarization will eventually occur when the hollow in question supplies a specific amount of riatsu into the bola. The amount of newtons necessary differs for every individual hollow, but when equilibrium with the bola occurs, and the riatsu output is matched, a reaction will inevitably take place which will result in arancarization. Naruto grinned. Good work, Sale. Your potential in the scientific field has shown well. I know that you're already appointed as my head scientist, but I think more congratulations are in order, he said politely. Think nothing of it, Naruto-sama. I am just happy to be of service to you. I feel that I must also mention that the formula needed to figure out Ryatsu equilibrium has been drafted by me personally. If you wish to arancarize yourself or one of your subjects— I implore you to visit the institution first so we may clear any chances of failure, Sayo replied. Naruto leaned back. I understand, Sayo. 
I believe we can begin Aaron Karasation for some of the lesser hollows in the kingdom, but I can't quite use it on myself yet, unfortunately. That goes for you and the generals, as well. Our full potential has not been fully realized yet, and it would be such a shame to allow that to go to waste. We will hold off on Aaron Karasation for the time being. For now, you will focus on your new duties. Once we can procure enough resources to undertake the operation, Naruto said, grinning at the thought of his scheme. As you wish, Naruto-sama, chuckled Sale underneath his breath. This new position really was all it was cracked up to be, and with Naruto's plan in the works, there was a treasure trove of knowledge waiting to be uncovered. I suggest you get started on those first. They are the most important part of the plan, and without them I can't achieve what I want. Come to me with the blueprints to them, and maybe then we can start mass-producing them. Sale bowed again making sure it was long and drawn out, as his career depended entirely on his new king's orders. Kanoha was the village that controlled the entire continent. It had all started around 150 years ago, when the greatest Hokage in history, the Rokudame, found a way to harness the chakra of the great fox Kyubi for the village's purposes. With its power at the village's disposal, and the breeding of super shinobi through the use of the chakra, Kanoha waged war against the other shinobi nations of the world for its righteous cause of conquering. The glorious will of fire would be spread throughout the entire world. And with the odds heavily in their favor, Kanoha succeeded. Once IWA fell to Kanoha, the others fell like dominoes, each one vying for some territory within the former Tsuchi no Kuni, and each one getting into some sort of conflict with Kanoha and the High no Kuni. One after another, they were crushed and assimilated within the empire and, after thirty years of fighting, the continent was theirs. The five great shinobi nations were no more, and now there was only one country, the Hai no Kuni and its linchpin Kanoha. Everything else was just a simply colony of the Hai no Kuni, and Kanoha benefited gloriously from it. The village was now five times the size it was since before the war, with several advancements in both shinobi theory and technology. The Hokage Monument still stood at the forefront of the village, its last face considered the greatest Hokage in history. The QB Chakra plan reached perfection 100 years before, and even a genin implanted with the stuff was massively skilled in using the chakra. They were so much stronger that a genin of today would probably be the equivalent of a high-level jounin from over a century ago. The Hokage mansion remained relatively untouched over the years, and today a tall, lean man was leaning over the balcony of his roof, looking over the beloved village that he lead. Shimura Daisuke was a great-something nephew of the Rokudame, Danzu. He was about twenty-five years old, with an angular handsome face, and a short head of straight, blonde hair. This man, who was skilled in the usage of Biji Chakra, ruled over the village as the seventeenth Hokage, a title he had long coveted. The day he received it was the second proudest moment of his life, and one that he had fulfilled less than a year ago. His proudest moment had occurred just the other day. His newborn daughter had been born less than two weeks ago. To add to the proud father moment, it turned out that she had an exceptionally powerful reaction to the QB implants injected into her. With any luck, she was a contender for 18th Hokage. They just needed to train her right. Her had named her Kanahaji, after the village that he loved so much. He had no doubt that she too would grow to love the village that was in her namesake. He wished that were the case with all his heart as this village was something that was worth loving. She looked so much like him, it was uncanny. Bright blue eyes, blonde hair, and two peculiar little whisker marks on each of her cheeks which seemed to signify her close connection with the QB's chakra. She was a happy baby, which Daisuke was content with, and he hoped he could keep the girl happy throughout her full life. Naruto-sama! Naruto-sama! cried one of Naruto's fastest messengers, who had found the king after he had mysteriously disappeared. The search had spread far and wide. With Naruto's grand project almost done, many were beginning to wonder if their king was beginning to get cold feet on the whole ordeal. Eventually, a group of his soldiers had claimed to have spotted him almost thirty miles inland on the next continent, a place almost completely untouched by desert hollows such as Naruto. This place was a dense jungle of trees, making it much more difficult for the search party to navigate. But eventually, 
their smallest and weakest messenger had found their king standing in a large clearing of sorts. As Naruto turned around to acknowledge his presence, the messenger noticed that the trademark spiral over Naruto's stomach was dimmer than usual. In fact, he looked somewhat drained. We've found you, my lord. Where have you been these past few months, Naruto-sama? Okuyora-sama has taken to ruling over El Reino Animal in your stead. The messenger asked tentatively, choosing his words carefully. Naruto grinned. What? I'm king, so that means I can take my leave any time I want. Unless you're making complaints about that. You complain in that? Asked Naruto weasley, getting up in the messenger's face. And no, sir. It's just we were worried. The messenger trailed off nervously. The excuse sounded somewhat useless to his ears. Worried? Somehow I doubt that. Naruto's eyes never left the messenger. Anyway, since the O's so important you must know what I was up to, I'll have you know that I was traveling to perfect my latest combat move. And from the looks of things, it seems I've perfected it. He turned to look behind him, into the strange clearing. These past hundred years since we've covered the secret to Aaron Karasation have been grueling for us. We've taken lots of territory, and gained the resources necessary. The only thing missing is the completion of sales preparations. But there was always one thing that bugged me more than anything so far. And now I've solved it. He chuckled darkly. I'm ready, he muttered cryptically. Naruto got up from the base of the tree, and began walking in the opposite direction, back towards camp. But something was on the messenger's mind. Wasn't there some sort of hollow kingdom right on this spot, Naruto-sama? He asked. Yeah, it actually began right at this clearing. Why don't you go take a look? I'll be heading back, now. He remarked offhandedly, which greatly confused the messenger. Out of perplexity, the small hollow walked forward into the clearing, noting that the ground here seemed to be singed. The messenger raised his eyes up to see what was in front of him, and they widened like saucers. W what the H hell. Naruto grinned as he walked through the jungle. Back in his throne room, Naruto pored over the notes that Reporo had left them all in an internal debate over how he should go about this particular business. His team of scientists had already gotten writing the particular Aaron Carr formula for him, as well as making sure that the facility was in perfect condition for the arrival of their king. I guess I had better get going then. This has gone on for far too long, and now it's time for me to evolve into the perfect being. The emperor hoisted himself from his throne and walked out of the room. His guards outside bowed as he exited the main building and descended into the reaches below. The few denizens who lived on the surface seemed to shy away from him in fear, a fact that Naruto took great pride in. Everyone gave him a wide berth as he made his way over to the institution and only the guards and sentries seemed to hold their post. With all the crazy architecture throughout the palace, Naruto's institution for research was by far the plainest and clean-cut building. It was boring old whitewashed stone, rectangular in shape and lacking any kind of windows. As he opened the glass door into the dimly lit hallway, the researchers and the guards stationed there gave him a deep bow, already aware of his intended presence. And Naruto-sama, it's such an honor to finally have you here after so much time. Please, Sail-sama is already waiting for you in the bottom sublevel. Let me escort you there immediately, muttered the nearest researcher, who seemed to be somewhat of a spokesperson for the entire building. He was a thin and gangly bird-like hollow, and from the way he looked Naruto could tell this was a product of one of Sail's particularly nasty experiments. Lumina! Start the elevator! He cried after Naruto had agreed to be escorted. Across the main foyer of the building, there came an opening against the whitewashed wall, where a circular ball-like elevator came rushing upwards to transport the emperor and his escort towards the bottom sublevel. Naruto vaguely watched the other hollow punch in some kind of numbers, but he was too absorbed with what was going to happen down there. As the elevator began coming and subsequently come to a halt, a new, polite voice rang out as they both exited the elevator. Naruto-sama, it is a pleasure to have you here, the voice said, and Naruto was treated to the sight of his head scientist himself, who would be overseeing the procedure. The worm hollow was standing over a short balcony, where below there were a few chairs, an operating table, a workbench, and the bola de evolution, which was closely safeguarded underneath its display. 
Sale, I take it you have everything prepared for me, then? Asked Naruto, who was getting restless. Oh yes, Naruto-sama. It was no trouble at all, save for configuring the formula necessary for you. Due to your massive amount of Ryatsu, it was decided as such. The equation seems to indicate that you need to apply 28,466 newtons of Ryatsu to the bola at a 37-degree angle. The bola, which contains the essence of the Shinigami will sink while your Ryatsu's hollow nature and emerge in equilibrium. While you are undergoing the transformation, a team of scientists plus myself will be on standby to contain the process of Arankarisation. So when you are ready, Naruto-sama, I must ask you to take a position on the operating table beside the Bola de Evolution. Naruto complied, walking down the short set of stairs to take a seat on the operating table. His Bola de Evolution stood merely five feet away from him, and its case was unraveling. Sail walked over to the main database, pushing a few buttons to configure something. All of a sudden, a strange tendril of Ryatsu shot out of a hole next to Naruto, wrapping itself around his right arm. A similar one was already working its way around his left one. All right, Naruto-sama. Those tendrils of Ryatsu are configured to limit your Ryatsu output. Once you reach the required amount of Ryatsu output into the ball, the tendrils will automatically cease your Ryatsu output. Once that happens you must simply keep a hold on the bola. Sale shouted this from his position. The bola's case seemed to moving right towards him. When these yellow tendrils turn red... I must ask you to immediately clutch the bola and pour your ryatsu into it. On the count of three. Three. Two. One. Now! Shouted Sail, as the tendrils turned red. Naruto didn't need any more instructions. He grabbed the ball forcefully, pouring all of his orange ryatsu into the powerful item, as the bola itself began to react. The energy swirling inside changed from a cool blue to a fierce orange. Naruto himself seemed to have a mix of both the blue Ryatsu and the orange Ryatsu. The tendrils themselves seemed to be strained as Naruto poured Ryatsu into the orb. The atmosphere itself seemed to be tingling as the whole facility began to shake violently. The strain was taking its toll on Naruto as well, as he roared and writhed violently yet continued to hold steady with his Ryatsu. Sail, meanwhile, was typing away like mad on the main database, trying to stabilize everything. This shouldn't be right. The backlash is far greater than any other hollow who has arancarized, and even we didn't expect such a large reaction to this. I have to. Verona! Stabilize the area. We need to prepare for a total meltdown here. Sail barked at the odd looking Arancar who was standing nearby. The round Arancar bounded off in a panic before Naruto's voice broke through the din. No! I've got this! He roared, the Ryatsu output increasing even further. The tendrils around him were starting to look close to breaking. Sail panicked, looking around before settling back down on his seat. Okay, the first part is almost done. Now comes the hard part of the operation, he said, as he punched in a few codes that appeared on the screen. The orb and Naruto seemed to be glowing with almost black Ryatsu, and a few seconds later the tendrils kicked in completely cutting off the flow of Ryatsu to the bola. However, what seemed to be a chain of Ryatsu connected the bola to Naruto's hollow hole. Naruto roared as black lines began covering his entire body, and he started to convulse in pure pain. He rose from the table, severing both tendrils like they were nothing, as black Ryatsu exploded from his body in a torrent, knocking back everyone in the room. Ugh, this is the most violent case we've ever seen so far. I need to hurry and contain the blast. Sayo grunted, forcing himself back onto his chair. The command to activate something appeared on the screen, and Sayo confirmed the process immediately. Four shafts opened down below where Naruto was, and many metallic panel burst forward from the opening, glowing with a deep silvery riatsu. The circled around Naruto, wrapping him in a cocoon of metal. The panels contained most of the riatsu, and for a few minutes the entire room was quiet. The lesser hollows were completely stunned at the reaction, and Sail was breathing very heavily. It. Looks. Like. We. Contained him. He wheezed, laying down at his station. The metal cocoon out on the floor was whirring slightly, apparently struggling to keep the being contained. There was a bang, and a large indentation appeared in the metal. 
Sayo looked up surprised, before the entire cocoon of metal was thrust off, severing the panels and throwing them all over the place. The Bola de Evolution was thrown out, landing safely away from the center of the chaos. A maelstrom of dust and bright orange riatsu obscured their emperor from view, but Sayo could make out a very humanoid shape within the center of the maelstrom. Chapter 29 El Plan and Effecto As the cloud of dust and riatsu settled, the hollows in the vicinity managed to find their way to their feet, despite the fact that there was now a heavy blanket of strong riatsu covering the entire atmosphere, making it difficult for them to breathe. Sayo felt a bead of sweat run down underneath his mask and took in the full sight. There was nothing quite like the sight of seeing a hollow evolve into a greater being, and it was no different for Naruto's evolution, which was magnified to a greater scale. The torrent that had surrounded him was palpable, even as it faded. The silhouette in the middle seemed to be in the process of morphing, as the figure's canine visage became more humanoid. His mask was starting to crack and eventually fell off, save for a few fragments that couldn't be made out in the dim light. His tails disappeared into his backside, his arms and legs became thinner, and he got ever so slightly shorter. The figure grinned psychotically, showing white teeth. White, human teeth unlike the razor-sharp fox canines that littered his mouth before. He released his riatsu somewhat, finding it was a little difficult to control. The cloud of dust settled completely, and Sayo feasted his eyes on the new and improved emperor. The newly nude human walked up the stairs to the balcony, casually grabbing one of the plain, brown robes meant for new Erinkar. He wobbled slightly, being slightly unused to the human body, but he clenched his feet and released his riatsu again, feeling the power well up inside him. He grinned wickedly letting out a throaty snicker that soon turned into full-blown laughter. He swung his arms from side to side, his subjects looking slightly uncomfortable at the maniacal laughter. Naruto-sama, are you all right? Sayo asked tentatively, taking in his king's new appearance. He was around five and a half feet tall, making him quite a short Erinkar. Being garbed in a simple brown robe, he looked the very picture of a common Erinkar, but the confidence— and Ryatsa he exuded gave off a presence of someone much higher. He left his robe open slightly at the collar, exposing his massive hollow hole, which curiously had remained over his heart instead of moving to another part of his body. His face was very boyish, a fact which surprised many of the hollows down there. He didn't look a day over sixteen, which just went to show that he hadn't aged a day from the time of his death. However, despite the fact that he didn't look older, there were still several differences on his face. His mask had broken into fragments, a given for a new Erinkar. The mask began with two very short pointed ears directly above his human ones, which rested against his temples. The mask continued to the side, arching around his eyebrows and curling underneath his eyes to a sharp point just below his bottom eyelid. His estigma took on the form of the whisker marks he had in life yet this time they were blood-red in color and almost looked like they were some type of war paint, which complemented his mask and almost gave him a sort of tribal vibe. His eyes were a deep scarlet red, and they were slanted slightly, giving some more remnants of his vulpine appearance from before. His hair was the same blonde spikes he had as a human. The new being looked so much like a human, but the reality was he was absolutely not a human. He wasn't even a Shinigami. He was an Erinkar. The other hollows in the room seemed to back away from him slowly, but Sale had enough courage to approach him immediately. The worm hollow reached out a tendril and touched Naruto's shoulder, which drew the emperor's attention away from his new body. Naruto-sama, I am pleased to announce that the operation was a complete success. You have now been officially arrancarized underneath the context of El Libro de Ciclos. But that's not all, your Zanpakutu is forming on the operating table below, the head scientist said. Naruto hummed lightly. A Zanpakutu, eh? One of those swords the damnable Shinigami carry around. Come to think of it, this new body is a little too human-like for my tastes. It reminds me of how much I hate them. But, if it will help me gain more power, then the Arankarization will definitely be worth it in the end, Naruto mused, walking down the steps, where he saw a sheathed sword materializing into existence on a pedestal next to where he was operated on. He grabbed the sword once it had finished materializing. He drew the Zanpakutu from its sheath, scrutinizing the weapon carefully. 
It didn't seem to be very similar to the katanas that the shinobi used. It was wider, and with the slight curve in the silver-bladed edge, Naruto realized that his weapon resembled a cutlass. Naruto mused that maybe the shape had something to do with the twisted and curved nature of his soul, but dismissed that as nothing more than lame symbolism. The blade gleamed in the dark, and Naruto's eyes were drawn towards the base. The hilt and guard of the Zanpaku to lack the basket-shaped characteristic of cutlasses. Instead, they were both red in color, with two extensions curving out of the guard and into the hilt like foxtails, coming together to form a rough heart shape. Hmm, I think I like it. Naruto said, fastening the Zanpakutu on his hip, and walking up to join Sail again. The Erenkar Zanpakutu works a little differently than the Shinigami Zanpakutu, Naruto-sama. Whereas the Shinigami Zanpakutu is the manifestation of that Shinigami's soul, the Erenkar Zanpakutu is the nuclei of your hollow abilities sealed within a sword. When you release said sword, you'll regain your true form. Sail explained. Good job on this recent assignment. Since the success of the Erenkarization, things have been coming along smoothly, if not a little slow. As for the other part, the part involved with the main plan, I would like you to show me the new bracelets. He said. Of course, Naruto-sama. They are completely ready. You have ordered the creation almost 100,000 of those, correct? They are currently being stored in the research vault. However, I could take you down to the main lab where I can show you the basics of how one works, Sail said. When Naruto nodded, Sail ordered Verona to open the elevator. He gestured for his king to enter, which the new Erenkar did after being followed by his head scientist. As you have ordered, these bracelets are the pinnacle of how this plan works, he explained in the elevator shaft, but was cut off as the elevator stopped, and the door flung open. The Erenkar and the hollow were now on the first sublevel, the main lab where several hollow and Erenkar scientists were toiling away at whatever nasty research they were doing. At the center of the room, there was a bracelet on display in a case, which was clearly meant to be fit on a human wrist. Naruto smiled when he saw the handiwork of his scientists on display. It has taken us so long to develop this incredible piece of technology. I won't bore you with technical details, but what it is in a nutshell is a miniaturization of the Shinigami's down eye. It can convert human cells into spirit particles, allowing them to enter soul society, or in this case Waco Mundo, when the bracelet is worn by the human in question. Brilliant, Sail, brilliant. Naruto commended, his voice now seeming to moan in ecstasy at the mere thought of such power and their control now. What about the other crucial part of the plan? He asked. That's the more difficult part of this, Naruto-sama. Although, we have perfected the technology needed to send humans into Hueco Mundo, we have not yet managed to stabilize a large enough garganta to hold an entire village. The most we have achieved is the size of about a house, said Sale. Well, keep working on it then. Since everything else is complete, you can devote all of your time to completion of this one final project. Once you complete the stabilization of the garganta, the operation is a go. Report to me immediately when your research is complete. You are to accompany me to the human world, and when the operation is complete, you are to be delegated to sublevel 14 of the institute. Do I make myself clear? Naruto ordered. Sail's eyes widened underneath his mask. Naruto-sama, why you're, he stuttered. Naruto grinned evilly. That's right, Sail. This is going to be your field day, he said, to which Sail leveled a grin just as twisted as his king's. So, they finally managed to stabilize that garganta then? Asked Naruto towards the messenger Sail had sent. The messenger saluted, confirming the statement. Yes, sir. With the combination of the Daunai bracelets as well as the stabilization of the giant garganta that can carry an entire village, the orders you gave us all those years ago are finally complete. We are prepared to begin the operation at any time you wish, Naruto-sama. Naruto smiled cruelly dismissing the guard before turning back to his throne. He charged the panel on the left side of his throne, allowing the screen which he used to communicate messages throughout the kingdom. Attention Alquiora, Noitra, Grimjow, and Sail. Report to the main throne room immediately for a strategic war session. This is mandatory, he ordered, making sure the message reached the four hollows in question. In time, Ferencar walked into the throne room. 
In the fifteen years since he had become an Erenkar, all four of his generals and his head scientists had followed. Okwiora and Haribel were able to rise to low-level Vasto lords before they evolved, but Sail, Neutra, and Grimjow all failed to achieve the Vasto lord status, instead settling to become very high-level Ajuch's Erenkar. About five minutes later, the first arrival appeared in the form of Naruto's right-hand man himself. Okuyora had changed from the stoic Bat Hollow to a stoic Erenkar. He was around the same height as Naruto, with almost albino skin, and slick black hair that reached his neck. He wore a brown robe like his king, and his mask fragments were a helmet that was split in half. Okuyora was silent as he entered the room, but it instantly became loud as the second and third arrivals got there. The first of them was a blue-haired Erenkar with a cat-like face, and a line of teeth on his right jaw. The next one was an extremely tall Erenkar with long black hair, a slanted face, and an eye patch. His signature scythe-like Sanpakatu was missing. The last arrival came in ten minutes later, an effeminate pink-haired Erenkar with hollow mask glasses and an almost seductive look on his face. He sauntered in after bowing to Naruto. Good, we're all here. Naruto said, satisfied. What about Haribel? Grimju piped up, noticing the lack of the only high-ranked female. Naruto shook his head. This entire process is going to be far too grisly for her to handle, so she's going to sit this one out. I can't have her thinking I'm anything less than the perfect messiah, now can I? She's just sitting in her chamber, worrying her pretty little head over something I set her on for the next few months, he said. Anyway, she's not important right now. The essential thing right now is that all the preparations for the plan have been completed. The village itself won't be any threat to us, but we need to get in there and get out quickly before a Shinigami captain shows up, he said. Why? Any one of us could take on a captain, easily, said Grimjow cockily, grinning at the prospect of a new fight. Don't underestimate the fighting power of a captain, Grimjow. And it's not too much about a captain, really. With a force of hollows this big coming to that continent, we could easily have the whole of Soul Society on us if we're not careful. And, as much as I hate to admit it, we're really not ready to handle them yet. Naruto seethed, hissing out the last part in anger. Understood, what do we need to do, Naruto? Okuyara asked. He didn't seem to be too concerned about any of this, though Naruto supposed that was to be expected. Here, Follow me to the back of the room and we'll discuss our course of action, he said, leading the four other hollows up to this large table opposite from his throne. There seemed to be a map pinned down upon it. The logo of the Reino Animals Science Institution was printed in the bottom corner. This is the updated map of Kanoha that the institution has drafted for me recently. It is a moderately sized village, and a surprisingly small capital for an empire of Kanoha's scale. It is my home village from when I was still a human, and a breeding ground for corruption. The village is ruled by a Hokage, the strongest shinobi, not to mention all the ninja they have in the village. However, with the might of our forces, the ninja won't be any trouble. What really worries me is the Shinigami, like I said earlier. We need to be in and out of this village in twenty minutes, tops. That's why I'm pulling out the big guns for this operation, Naruto said. He placed attack on the Hokage mansion, while he placed several more at sixteen different points around the outskirts of the village. I'll be the one to capture the Hokage. Okuyora, Grimjow, Noitra, the sixteen yellow tacks you see represent the Garganta from where our forces will enter the village. You know what to do from there. Sail, your role has changed these past few years. Instead of accompanying me personally, I want you to stay here and personally supervise the configuration of the giant Garganta. Make sure you link the main database to a position where you can see us. When we are finished in the village, we will send up a flare to personally notify you to the configurations. He ordered, to which Sale understood. Sounds simple enough, he remarked. The plan itself is unfailingly simple. It was the technology we needed that took up all this time. Naruto replied. The rest of you get to your positions and rally the forces. Sail, I expect the shipments of bracelets to the docking zone. We will depart for the human world in five days, he ordered to the rest of them. The four responded without question to their orders. When the four went their separate ways to prepare, Naruto sat on his throne, grinning. 
This will be fun. Fifteen-year-old Shimura Kanahaji was the most talented prodigy that Kanahagakur no Sato had ever seen. Her natural talent, coupled with her love of the village and sheer willpower, as well as the superior genetics she had received by being part of the Shimura clan. She had completely mastered the usage of the Kyubi's chakra, being able to call on all nine tails, blowing her father's previous record of six tails out of the water by far. She had long surpassed him anyway, and would continue to grow into probably the finest Hokage in existence, for she was guaranteed to be next in line. Right now, she was walking through the clean streets of the village, smiling at the all the happy people who went about their daily lives. Truly, their village, no, their empire was a wonderful place. But she had other concerns to worry about. She was going to meet her friends at the original Ichiraka Ramen stand, which had long grown into a chain that had spread throughout the empire. She had heard that originally the chain was just that tiny stand who made a modest business over two hundred years ago during the reign of the Sanding. That was unbelievable for one thing, but she supposed it was similar to how all the clans had survived throughout the years. Hey, Kanahaji, you're here! shouted a loud boisterous voice, as a feral fifteen-year-old walked out of the stand she had just arrived at. Inazuka Nikuki looked remarkably like his distant ancestor, down to the voice. Out of all the clans, the Inazukas were probably the ones that benefited the most out of the Kyubi's chakra. Their canine-like speed, nose, and strength were only boosted more. Kanahaji smiled softly, and laughed lightly, a gentle tinkle which made the Inazuka blush slightly. Hey, Nikukyu. You're looking well, she commented. Not as good as you're looking, Kanahaji. Fifteen years old, and already the strongest in the entire village. I hear your dad might even retire soon, and you might be made Hokage sooner than expected. We'll see, dog breath. We'll see. She laughed again, and walked into the restaurant, where she saw that five of her other friends had already arrived. Abiraim Shini, Nara Rei, Hyugaharna, Akimichi Chouma, and Yamanaka Inos. All five of them turned towards her with smiles on their faces, though it was hard to with Shini and his high collar and jacket. She took a seat at their table next to Rei and waved when the smiling waitress gave her a menu. So, how have you all been? She asked ordering up a few bowls of miso ramen? Could be better. We were gone on a mission to the former Tsuchi no Kuni in order to suppress a rebellion against the empire. It was a pain to say the least, Ray drawled. The always deadpan expression on her face made her look far plainer than she actually was. I wouldn't say that, Ray. You need to be more motivated for missions, came a suave, silky voice. The handsome Yamanaka Inos threw back his long hair and locked eyes with his teammate. Whatever. Maybe I'll become more motivated when a certain someone takes over as Hokage, the female Nara said, looking at Kanahaji, who blushed after being put on the spot. I told you before. I'm... Food's here, shouted Choma, and a kimichi even bigger than the ones from Naruto's time. Indeed, he had gone and ordered himself at least ten bowls before Kanahaji had even arrived, which explained why he had gotten his food so quickly. Ray sighed. Chulma, you just couldn't wait until Kanahaji arrived before you got your food, could you? She asked rhetorically, to which Chulma looked up from his bowl and stared at her intently. When you're in a restaurant, waiting is for the weak. No exceptions, he said shortly, before return to his bowl, allowing everyone there to contemplate just how that made sense. The group remained silent, and all that could be heard was the slurping and munching of Chuma's eating. Kanahaji enjoyed the peace and quiet a little bit, but she hoped there was more to talk about within their little group. She raised a glass of water to her lips. So, does she was cut off, as the air around her became unbearably heavy, like she was being suffocated. The glass slipped from her hands, and shattered into a million pieces upon the floor. She looked up to see that the atmosphere itself seemed to be heavily distorted due to the intense pressure. Her friends seemed to be affected the same way she was, and the other patrons were doing even worse, several of them on their knees panting for breath. W what in the H hell is this? I've n never felt anything like it. It's a almost like it's from out of this W world, she panted. Her friends looked at her warily, as if something that could make her afraid is something they would not want to tangle. Haruki burst into tears, 
the powerful pressure finally forcing her to her knees. Kanahaji attempted to place a reassuring hand upon her shoulder, but she couldn't get it up, and she too collapsed onto the floor and began choking. The others followed her soon after. After nearly a minute of choking, Kanahaji forced herself to her feet. She darted in the direction of the door, looking back to see her friend's pleading glances. K. Kanahaji. Ray croaked out. Come on guys, you need to pull yourselves together. We might be under attack. She screeched at them. It seemed an entirely foreign thought. Who would dare attack the great village of Kanoha? It was the linchpin of the great empire that controlled the entire continent. Attacking it was blasphemy, and every citizen in the empire knew it. She smiled when her friends pulled themselves to their feet, some struggling more than others. Come on, we've got to find my father, she ordered, to which her friends followed her out of the restaurant and into the village. The sight that met their eyes was like something they couldn't even comprehend. Ah, the fresh smell of Kanoha. There's nothing like it. I don't think I've ever smelled anything that's made me this sick before. Naruto mused to himself, as he stepped out of the garganta hovering over the village. The wind rustled through the Erenkar's hair, as he took a deep breath and surveyed the village. He was hanging out in midair, watching the sheep as they plodded through the daily lives without a care in the world. They had no idea what was about to happen to them, and the thought of that only made Naruto giddier. Surely, the ability to snuff out life so easily, without them even knowing made him truly sublime. He heard the distant whirring noise of opening Garganta, seeing the black voids open on the outside perimeters of the village. After they fully opening, thousands of hollows poured from the portals. Most of them seemed to release their riatsu, creating a waft of the pressure that surrounded the village, and made the villagers and shinobi alike collapse. He spotted a few shinigami that were patrolling the village. They had taken notice of the gargantas, and the hollows that were pouring out of them. Their mouths were agape, and they seemed to be in too much shock to do anything productive. All the more advantage for him, Naruto supposed. A slightly larger garganta opened about one hundred feet above him, and from it poured this sort of blue riatsu. It blanketed the village before spreading towards the perimeter where the other garganta were. It rose in the air, creating a force field of energy around the village. Looks like sail has started. That force field of Riazza will make us visible to the humans. Look like everything's going according to plan so far. Naruto mused. He looked over and spotted the Hokage mansion. It seemed to remain untouched after all these years. The Hokage would be there, most likely, so Naruto would head there while his army dealt with the rest of the village. They had their orders. Speaking of the village, all of them seemed to have noticed the portal's opening and were staring in perplexity at the voids, until that confusion turned to terror as the first wave of hollows began to rush in the village. Naruto stepped into the direction of the Hokage mansion, hoping that the Hokage himself would have taken notice by the time he got there. He opened his robe slightly, showing about ten dumb eye bracelets attached to his belt buckle. Well, looks like it's about time to get started. Chapter 30 La Destruction de Kanoha Panic flooded the village as its citizens laid their eyes upon what could only be creatures from some sort of twisted nightmare. That, pressure they were exuding was unnatural, and there were so many of them. No one seemed to know where they were coming from. Loathsome creatures, every last one of them. Some were big, some were small, but the fact of the matter is that they all were repulsive. Lewd, warped beings that were covered in these strange masks for which evil, black eyes lay underneath. These eyes seemed to be filled with nothing more than a desire to destroy humans. Some had long, cruel claws meant for nothing more than evisceration, some had long, wiry limbs, and some were completely alien in nature, different from anything the people had ever seen before. These ones were the most disgusting of the bunch, as they often oozed a horrible green liquid from oversized, gangrenous pores while they drooled a filthy acidic liquid, or they had many disproportional limbs in the wrong places. They poured into the village, letting loose their unnatural cries. Moan, wail, and shriek they did, but what made the villagers' hair stand on end was purely, unnatural roar that the creatures made. The villagers of Kanoha dropped whatever they were holding at the moment, stopped to stare in horror at the army of these foul creatures that began to pour into their beloved village at an almost impossible rate. A few babies wailed in anguish, 
Children screamed in terror, but they were ignored by the shell-shocked citizens. It was at that point that the citizens of Kanoha dissolved into their baser instincts. Many of them screamed and ran, their fight-of-flight responses working way overdrive on flight, while they searched in any direction to find an escape route out of the village. The shinobi, much more experienced with seeing and dealing with such things, were not panicking, but even they felt themselves strangely fearful of the new beings. They tried to maintain order within the village, but the hollow's incredibly sudden appearance had rendered their efforts useless. There were simply too many people panicking to organize an orderly evacuation, and the hollows were beginning to attack the civilians. One shinobi winced as a poor old woman was attacked by one of the twisted creatures. It easily hoisted her into the air screaming, purposefully applying enough pressure to make her bones snap. She wailed in torment, as the hollow continued to stomp on the broken arm until it was a bruised, broken mess that was pointed at an unnatural angle. To add fuel to the fire, the hollow pulled this strange bracelet out of the nowhere and attached it to the old woman's broken arm. The shinobi wondered about the purpose of the bracelet, but they had a feeling it couldn't be anything good. The only thing to do now was organize a counterattack on the creatures, though without their Hokage's guidance it would disorganize at best. Nevertheless, a few shinobi teams had taken to the forefront, while others attempted to corral the citizens or find safety for themselves. The Shinigami patrolling the village had known about the invasion long before the shinobi did. It all began when a new Shinigami recruit received a signal from the Soul Society. With a lazy grin, he opened his spirit phone to glance at his radar, and was floored when a beam of red stared back at him through the phone. It vibrated for a few seconds before it actually exploded due to overheat, leaving the stunned and confused Shinigami without a beeline on the hollows. It turns out he didn't have to wait long to find them. What the hell, he said as he turned around and saw the massive flood of hollows pouring through the village gates. His breath caught in his throat at the wave of hollows, and their brutality towards the hapless citizens of Kanoha. Many of them were Minos Grande. This can't be possible, he murmured, fear gripping his heart in its icy grip. His body didn't respond to his mind telling him to run, and he stood rooted to the spot. Back up, we need back up. Do we even have enough backup for this? He asked himself frantically, beginning to suffocate on the riazza that was being emitted from the collective hollow force. There were only fifteen shinigami in the village at the time, and their communicators may have short-circuited from the riazza. He hoped they would be able to call in Soul Society, and get a captain here, pronto. But he knew in his heart that just one captain wouldn't be able to put a stop to all this. As for right now, he needed to fight. He drew his Zanpakutu and faced the swarm of hollows, though something was strangely off about them that the Shinigami couldn't understand. This isn't normal hollow behavior at all, he thought to himself. The hollows should be devouring humans on the spot, but not a single one of them was doing that, surprisingly. Instead, they were carrying these strange bracelets, and were going around the village attaching them to whatever human they could find. Men, women, children, the elderly. It seemed that not a single human was spared from the hollow's agenda. The bracelets seemed to immediately knock out the humans, rendering them helpless to be taken. But even when unconscious, the hollows did not eat them. I have to do something, he said, trying to spring into action against the closest hollows he could find. He was gutted by a wiry limb before he could even reach them, his zanpaka to falling to his side uselessly. As the shinigami died, he saw the shinobi of the village spring into action against the hollows, despite how little of a chance they actually had. Why they were doing that and not trying to escape, the shinigami didn't know. Wait, the humans, can they see the hollows? Those were the shinigami's last thoughts as he died. Kanahaji gasped as she exited the ramen stand, and feasted her eyes upon the things that were ravaging her village. She gasped a second time as a shinobi team activated their fox cloaks and rushed after a group of about twenty of the creatures. While a jounin seemed to be rushing towards a wave of the creatures that appeared to be doing something to the civilians. She didn't know what was more alarming. The fact that her comrades were fighting what appeared to be creatures from a child's nightmare, or that the famed QB chakra that had been so effective and reliable for them in the past failed to harm the beings. A million thoughts ran through her mind at that moment and she was quickly being overwhelmed and would lose the ability to think rationally. 
Should she just in the fray against these creatures, or should she rescue the helpless civilians? It seemed like the shinobi needed rescuing as well, as she saw a group of A and B get chained by a swarm of the creatures, their abilities useless against the creatures. Father. I've got to find my father. He'll know what to do here. He'll know how to repel these monsters, she thought to herself, hiding in the shadows as one of the creatures passed her by, chasing after an escaping middle-aged man. Fortunately, they didn't seem to be that intelligent. She almost screamed with fright as she felt a tap on her shoulder, before mentally cursing herself. Did the stress of the situation really make her lose track of the most basic of ninja skills? She turned to confront the monsters, her QB chakra rising to the occasion, but it plummeted when she saw that it was her friends who had approached her. Ray grasped her shoulders lightly, sensing her friend's agitation. Kanahaji, calm down. Don't lose control of your chakra or your senses. That will only make this situation worse. We're ninja, remember, and we have to look underneath the underneath. There is a way out of this situation, no matter how bleak it looks right now. We're the proud village of Kanoha, remember, and we're all in this together. We're not about to let you run off on your own in this crisis. We need to work as a team, she explained. Kanahaji bit her lip before looking at the reassuring smiles that ran through the faces of her friends. They were in this together, Kanahaji realized, and they would fight together for their village. You're right everyone, we can get through this if we work together. There are certain things we must take care of first, such as finding my father. He'll know what to do, she said. Her friends nodded in agreement to the sound plan. We're behind you all the way, Kanahaji, said Nikukyu to which Kanahaji smiled softly again. Naruto looked out over the village, smiling madly as his army had reduced the bustling village to a cacophony of chaos in a mere two minutes. The Shinigami patrolling the village had already been killed under the onslaught of numbers, and it would be a while before they could get anyone stronger out here. But still, they had limited time to fulfill the requirements, but his army was performing surprisingly well given the circumstances. Okuyora and some of the others he had appointed high positions were there to severely punish those who broke the rules and ate. The bracelets were working wonders in this situation, and he sat back and enjoyed himself as he watched Grimjow chain a family of five, cackling all the way, as he punched out the father who was foolishly trying to defend his family. The Erenkar sat down on the shingles of a roof, watching his army haphazardly throw unconscious humans into a messy pile near the center of the village. Several of them were bruised and beaten already, but as long as they were alive it didn't really matter. He laughed as he saw an ANBU squad attempt to drive his army away from the pile so they could rescue the citizens, but they were quickly repelled. He winced mockingly as a young child got trampled by the wave of panicking villagers. Surely, there would at least be a few ones that died here and there. The kid's head was crushed underneath the boot of a much larger man with a heavy footfall. A few hollows laughed as some civilians stared in horror, though the large man didn't even pay attention to any of that. While this operation would be considered a disgusting crime against humanity to nearly everyone, Naruto saw it as the most beautiful thing he had ever witnessed. Seeing every last man, woman, and child in Kanoha being chained by his army, where they would later be escorted to Hueco Mundo. He had something so brutal in store for them there that he would hold off his climax until then. The fact that his armies were brutalizing them right now on his orders were mere peanuts. The kid's death was insignificant, and the screaming and begging of the villagers to stop didn't matter to him. He was controlling his joy right now, trying to mask the fact that he just wanted to jump for joy right about now. Well, I guess it's about time for me to get in on this action, too. I wouldn't be able to forgive myself if I let all these opportunities pass me by. Naruto said, rising to his feet as if it was just another day at the store for him. He brushed off his brown robe before he set his eyes on the Hokage mansion. Perfect, his target was already out and about, surveying the destruction of his village in horror from the balcony in his office. He also seemed to be barking orders to NBU guards, who activated their QB state and rushed down towards the village below. You call that usage of the QB's chakra? And here I thought Danza's research would come up with something a little more fruitful. Though I guess it was enough to conquer this pathetic continent. Naruto thought to himself, seeing how the ANBU had only mastered a whopping one tail's worth of power. Oh, hello? 
What's this? He asked himself, as he witnessed a group of seven teenagers appear in a flash on the roof. They seemed to be searching for the Hokage, but Naruto's attention was drawn on the one at the head of the pack. Oh, hell no! What the fuck? He hissed, seeing the girl's startling resemblance to his old Oriok form. She even had blue eyes, and there were even two cute little whisker marks on her young cheeks. Maybe some of his genetic material had been donated to those with a particularly strong reaction to the chakra, though whether that was the case Naruto didn't know. She looks almost exactly like me, and because of that she's probably extra talented with the Kyubi chakra or some shit like that. Not to mention, those brats behind look almost exactly like my old friends. This is a bad joke, and whoever came up with this stupid idea needs to die. He appearance on the shingles of the roof on the floor directly below the balcony, able to catch a glimpse of his targets from that angle. He fidgeted with the bracelets he had around his waist, itching to get in on some of the action. The Hokage had his back facing him, and he seemed to be addressing the seven teenagers. He even adopted a neutral, detached expression, though even Naruto with his lack of empathy could figure out that he was just hiding his true feelings behind a mask of stoicism. Dad, what are you doing here? Can't you see the village is under attack? Shouldn't you be giving orders to evacuate the civilians? Kanahaji screamed, to which Naruto scoffed. What did they take him for? That force field did more than just make them visible. Kanahaji. Daisuke croaked back. Why are you here? He seemed to be in too much shock to anything, possibly from the relief that his precious daughter was still alive. Why am I here? I'm here because I'm worried about the village. Kanoha can't be destroyed like this. We can't die by this, can we? She asked, the pride in her village resurfacing towards her voice. Kanahaji, look around you. There's a giant barrier of chakra that's surrounding the village, preventing our civilians' escape. Our ninja are taking the attack to these strange beasts, but even the Kyubi's chakra isn't doing a thing to them. I'm afraid to say that we may be over our heads on this one. He sighed, much to the shock of the kids after hearing such cowardly words come from their Hokage. Kanahaji clenched her fists together and stared at the ground. Her cheeks were tinted red, though it was probably out of anger rather than embarrassment. She was definitely disappointed in her father for saying that. Wow, I never realized the Hokage of Kanoha was such a pussy. Oh well, it's just one thing on the laundry list of reasons why I hate this village. Naruto mused to himself not voicing his thoughts out loud. How can you say that? Have you lost so much pride just in the face of danger that you have forgotten everything that Kanoha represents? The will of fire, have you forgotten about that too? The sense of unity that everyone has within the village. We're responsible for them. I'm not gonna run away and turn my back on them, and I'm not gonna go back on my word. Because that is my Nindo, she cried, pouring her heart out to the sky. Tears were beginning to settle in her eyes, as she looked once again at the chaos that had descended on the village. It was a grisly scene to be sure, and Kanahaki's heart poured out towards those who may have already lost their lives. Kanahaji, whispered Nikukyu. Oh, fuck no. Naruto thought. That bitch is dead. Daisuke glanced at his daughter with a compassionate look on his face, not as the seventeenth Hokage, not as a member of the Shimura clan but as a father. A look of regret passed over his face, before he walked up to the crying girl and hugged her tightly. Sure, it's okay, baby. I know how hard it must be for you to see the village in such a terrible state. You, more than anyone else, love this village, and it would tear you apart to see it destroyed. You're right, Kanahaji, absolutely right. This is no time to be wallowing in hopelessness. We need to pool our minds together, and find a way out of this situation he said, and the six teenagers around them joined their friend in a group hug. But first, he said, taking on a much more intense tone of voice as he broke the hug. Why don't you stop hiding and show yourself? He said. His daughter wiped her tears and glared intently over the balcony, having sensed the presence a while ago. He had been waiting for one of the creatures to show up here, but he didn't think that they had the intelligence for subtly. This one could be even more dangerous than the others. There was a flash of something, and the group of eight's eyes widened as a young man that couldn't be over sixteen appeared right before, the psychotic grin on his face unnerving. 
His dress was very odd to the group, being garbed in a tattered brown robe that was a little too big for him. There seemed to be a sword strapped on his hip. But what was really alluring was his face, having this strange, white thing that covered part of his face and the war paint on his cheeks. Honestly, to the group the boy didn't look human. Are you gonna show another display of crying again? Because that bitch's misery over there was really amusing to me. All that crap about oh, it's my Nindo and oh, this village is so awesome while bawling her eyes out like a baby. He yelled, performing a crude imitation of Kanahaji's voice when the need arose. The hate that was rising out of the people in front of him almost made him moan, and he lapped it all up. Who are you? asked the Hokage. Me? Oh, I'm just a little old errand car who was walking along the beaten path, and it just so happens I stumbled across this backwater little village. So I think to myself, he placed his hand underneath his chin in a mock thinking pose. Hey, I should use my armies to crush this place into the dust. So, here we are now, and if it's any indication, you seem to be getting crushed, he said. Armies? You mean you're the one behind all this? Accused Kanahaji, her voice shaking in anger. Do I have to spell it out for you idiots? Yes, I'm that one that brought these hollows to these pitiful little village, and I'm not leaving until I see it completely leveled. There it was again, that beautiful hatred that Naruto loved so much. But, of course... I'm not going to be satisfied just by killing you. No, I have something else much worse in mind for this miserable little village. Something so bad that you'll all be wailing for death at the end of it. He guffawed. Kanahaji almost started forward to attack the Erenkar, but she was held back by her father. How? How could you be so depraved? You want to torture every person in this village? Even civilians? Even women and children? Are you really that big of a monster? She said, shaking in her father's grasp. Naruto shut his eyes and gave her a lazy grin as he blew her off, though the girl's father spoke up next with something that would anger Naruto quite significantly. What I want to know is how a child like you manages to control a massive hordes of these things. If anything, I'm calling your bluff out right now, he said calmly, unconvinced that someone like Naruto could control this massive horde of creatures. Naruto blinked. He did not just say that. Listen, bitch, he began, insulting the Hokage, to which all the kids around him bristled. I don't give a fuck what you think about me controlling these hollows, but that isn't going to save your village, is it? You will be enslaved, you will be taken back into Hueco Mundo, and you will be tortured for my own personal amusement. And, as for you, there's something about you personally that sets my hair on edge. You remind me too much of that damnable old bastard Danzu he muttered. Daisuke's eyes widened. How do you know that name? Daisuke shouted. Kanahaji's eyes widened along with her friends. The way he was talking about Danza made it seem like this kid once knew him. But that was impossible. Naruto grinned, and Kanahaji felt a rock drop into her stomach. She peered at him carefully, peeling away the bizarre mask and inhuman features. His appearance reminded her of someone— He was our ancestor, the greatest Hokage known to the village who provided us with our own Kyubi chakra. Daisuke continued, breaking the silence. Kanahaji remained quiet, though she appeared to be shaking, but in fear, wonder or anger no one knew. Hmm, figures he would cover an incident like that up. Tell me, have you ever wondered where he managed to get that Kyubi chakra in the first place, hmm? Naruto asked. What are you Kanahaji started? but a sudden pressure overcame her, taking the words from her mouth and forcing her to her knees. She looked up at the creature in front of her, seeing him coated in an orange layer or an energy that wasn't chakra. In the background, she saw a silhouette of what appeared to be a fox head. Allow me to introduce myself. Naruto Uzumaki, Emperor of the Reino Animal in Hueco Mundo, and original Jinchuriki of the Kyubi no Yuko. Pleased to make your acquaintance, he said bowing mockingly to the group. Oh, original Jinchuriki? Kanahaji asked, losing her rigid stance as she pondered the exact meaning of those words. You mean, you're, but that's impossible. You don't look any older than I do. She yelled at Naruto. The Erenkar looked at her oddly, before he laughed. Ironic, isn't it? I died here over two hundred years ago, 
protecting this village while its people provided me with nothing in return. And then, that bastard ancestor of yours had the gall to experiment on my corpse and find the secret of the QB chakra in order to mass-produce walking shitstains like you. Kinda funny, don't you think? He said, letting his riazza diminish into nothing. D. Dead? Kanahaji replied, turning white as a sheet as her phobia kicked in. So, T that means why you're a, 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 she stammered, as she pointed a trembling finger at Naruto. Naruto grinned. Boo! Kanahaji screamed. Kanahaji! Don't let his lies get to you! This kid is not from the sixth Hokage's time period, nor is he a ghost. This kid obviously has some sort of kekai genkai, one that's disposition toward genjutsu. He is merely toying with you, her father shouted, drawing her from her reverie. Oh, do you want to see if I'm really toying with you, ho? Ka, ji sama, Naruto drawled, drawing out every syllable as long as he could. Or is the little boy too scared he's gonna get out? He mocked using baby talk, making kissy faces at the group. That appeared to do it for Shimur Daisuke, as the others stared at him as he began to draw on the legendary Kyuubi's chakra. His nails lengthened into claws, his eyes turned red and slitted, and faint whisker marks appeared on his cheeks. A vicious red chakra surrounded his body in the shape of a fox, forming a cloak of sorts with one tail at the end. One-tailed state, huh? Naruto commented, and the Hokage narrowed his eyes further. You made a big mistake in targeting Konoha, boy. I've had enough of these conversations with you, and I'm not going to let you fulfill your twisted desires any longer. The will of fire burns in all of us in Konoha, and you will never take that away from us. I am the seventeenth Hokage, and I have inherited the will of fire from those that came before me. As long as I'm here, you will never shake the foundation that is Konoha, he roared. Naruto yawned before grinning and reaching his hand towards his sword. He grasped the hilt of his zanpaku too tightly as he charged up his riatsu. He then he drew the cutlass slowly and held it at arm's length pointing the bladed edge of the sword at the Hokage. The gleaming cutlass seemed to draw the attention of the seven teenagers, having never seen a weapon quite like it before. He looked towards the sky, his eyes spacing out as he disregarded all the shinobi in front of him. Shall we get this over with? I've been wanting to satiate my blood lust for a very long time, you know. And don't worry about anything when you lose, I've got a very special bracelet with your name on it he said, taking one of the bracelets off his belt and holding it up. Those are, Kanahaki thought, looking at the bracelet carefully. Dad, those awful bracelets are what the creatures are using to capture the civilians around the village. They seem to have some important purpose, but I can't figure it out. Kanahaji piped up, and her father nodded. Stand back, you guys. I can't let you get in on this mess while on my watch, he said. Kanahaji looked like she was about to protest vibrantly, but her friend Ray placed a hand on her shoulder. Come on, Kanahaji, let's stand back and let Daisuke sama deal with this. He's our Hokage, after all, she said reassuringly, which slightly calmed down Kanahaji. Yeah, there's no way Hokage sama could ever lose. I bet he'll send this kid packing within seconds. You more than anyone should know just how strong he is. Nikuki piped up. Kanahaji smiled at the reassurance, stepping back a safe distance so she wouldn't get caught up in the fight. You can do it, daddy. Show him what the village of Kanoha is made of. She cheered from afar. Souped up on Kyubi Chakra, Daisuke rushed over to the side, going for a more subtle angle where he could attack. This would be a perfect feint attack to catch his opponent off guard, and then he would go in for the actual kill. He began some hand seals for a special Shimura clan jutsu and he never knew what hit him. His hands flopped uselessly to his sides, and he didn't even have time to perform a kawarimi which he could use to avoid the attack. It was just so fast, so fast that Daisuke had never seen anything like it. It was beyond shinobi level speed, to the point where it looked like he had just appeared out of nowhere and attacked him. He wasn't even able to react. It wasn't like he was an incompetent hokage or anything. He had mastered all levels of Shimura clan jutsu, to the point of being able to summon the Baku, and he had mastered the usage of the Kyuubi's chakra, which he hadn't used much in his fight. This thing had outclassed him in every way. This thing was no human. 
A heavy gash coated the right side of his chest where the creature had sliced him, and he fell to the ground in a heavy thud. Naruto was standing around five feet away with his back turned to the downed Hokage. He licked the blood off his sword before sheathing it, before turned around and slowly walked towards the Hokage, holding up the bracelet ominously. The last thing Daisuke remembered was his arm being forced into that thing before it activated, and he lost consciousness. Naruto turned back towards the seven teenagers who were standing around fifty feet away on the other side of the balcony. Their mouths were all agape and they seemed to be in too much shock to even move. It made sense, the Hokage was pretty much infallible, and to lose them pretty much meant that we're fucked. Most of them seemed to realize that at least. The anticlimactic, one-sided battle may not have helped. And then, Kanahaji moved while her friends seemed to be in too much shock to do anything. She screamed in anger and sorrow as she buffeted towards the monster who had attacked her father, six tails of red chakra flowing behind her. She was fully intent on ripping that creature's throat out, making him eat it, and then shit it out. I'll kill him. I'll kill him. She screamed in her thoughts, as pure hatred and anger fueled her chakra and willed her body to move towards the errand car. She was almost there, hand at the ready. She aimed it towards his jugular, and noticed the smug smile on his face. She would wipe that grin off his face. She would. Slash. Thump. The fifteen-year-old girl slumped to the ground defeated, her cubic cloak armor being no match for the Ryatsa-tempered sword that had slashed through her right shoulder. She looked up at Naruto, who was glaring down at her like some fierce god. He released his Ryatsa slightly, which shaded his red eyes from view and gave him a more intimidating feel. He reached onto his belt and pulled out another bracelet, and time slowed to a crawl as the girl anticipated her fate. A monster, she croaked out her voice a low, fearful whimper now as tears flowed from her eyes. Mercy was given to her for the time being as she too lost consciousness as the bracelet was attached to her. Naruto hoisted the unconscious girl to her feet by her right arm, before cruelly tossing her over to where her father lay. The treatment of their friends seemed to shock the others out of their stupor, but before they could even think about becoming enraged they too were slashed to pieces and captured. He looked at his own pile of the eight people he had captured, before looking out across the balcony. It seemed that his forces were finishing up, rounding up a few stragglers that had managed to escape them for a surprising amount of time. There came a flash from someone behind him, but he immediately recognized the Ryatsu. He hoped that this individual had now fully completed the tasks he had given him. Hmm, Okuyora, I take it you've done your fair share of the work here? He asked. Yes, Naruto. I have personally taken to capturing quite a few of the humans. But that's not what's important right now. My forces have finished rounding up every human in the northern sector of Kanoha, and both Grimjow and Noitra will be finished with theirs in less than five minutes. He reported. That's good. We're making almost perfect time, so I guess I can send the signal to sail at this moment. He explained, before his finger began to glow a bright red. He pointed the Ryatsu glowing finger towards the sky before firing a burst of the energy which crackled in midair before exploding into a brilliant display of red and orange. Their sails should easily be able to see that flare on his monitor. Setting up the mass garganta shouldn't take him very long at all, since they've already had this prepared before the invasion. Are all the Shinigami dead? He asked. Yes, they stood no chance for this massive amount of hollows that flooded the village. There were fifteen of them patrolling the village five of which were seated officers within their division. Their bodies have all been accounted for. Good, but Soul Society has probably picked up these signals by now. It won't be long before they react accordingly, and at this rate it may be half of their forces. That is why I've decided to leave the rest of the continent alone. We simply don't have the time to go and crush all these villages, and with the power vacuum created by Kanoha's sudden absence, they'll probably destroy themselves within a few years anyway. The elemental countries weren't exactly known for their peace-loving qualities. Even Kanoha, who had preached a message akin to that for its early years was always a little trigger-happy. I understand, Naruto. I will order my forces to cease their attacks, said Alquiora before there was a loud, whirring noise that covered the entire village. The blue force field that surrounded the village distorted slightly, before flickering back into existence. 
Naruto grinned. Well, that was even quicker than I expected, he said happily, as a rift in the space began to open. The rift widened to almost a five-mile radius, large enough to engulf the entire village in its embrace. Naruto saw the black space start to close around him, the hollows, and all the humans who had been converted into Kampaku form by the bracelets. Looks like you won't need to order them to do anything, Okuyora. We're on our way back already, and we've got company in tow with us. I just hope this influx of humans will keep Hueco Mundo stable. I'm sure we don't have to worry about that, Naruto-sama, said Okuyora, reverting back to the honorific as he, Naruto, and every life form in the entire village was engulfed by the Garganta. When the rift in space closed and the Garganta disappeared, all that was left was a ramshackle, burning village. The once great village, and capital of the shinobi world was now a simple ghost town, a shadow of its former self. No one resided within those walls, and for the next few days the people of the elemental countries were baffled at the sudden disappearance of the most powerful ninja state that had ever existed. Chapter 31 Monstro Completo The first indication that Kanahaji wasn't dreaming was when she woke up on the cold, unforgiving tiled floor in an unknown location. It was nowhere near the warm, cozy bed in the Hokage mansion where she was used to sleeping, and the fact of the matter was she was strewn rather roughly across the floor, as if the person who brought her here had no idea how to treat a lady. The second thing that hit her was the fact that whatever had happened in Konoha wasn't a dream. The village had been attacked, that boy had kidnapped every one of them, and most importantly, their village had fallen. That boy, no, not boy. Whatever that thing was, he had succeeded. Succeeded in the most horrible way possible, that was. So, all those atrocities, they really happened, she thought glumly to herself. Our village, it's gone, she dwelt on her destroyed village a little more, before she returned to the most prominent issue at hand. She would worry about the village later, as long as the people were alive, then that was all that mattered. She seemed to be first one to be roused from her unconsciousness as every villager in Kanoha was still in deep slumber, currently unaware of the horrors that were about to befall them. All of them seemed to be held in this enormous storage room of sorts, their bodies haphazardly thrown all over the place without a care in the world. She was placed relatively close to a tiny door near the south side of the room, which seemed to be their only escape option, the walls and floors of the room seemingly made out of thick metal that would impossible to bust through. She turned the thick, metal handle on the door, thoroughly anticipating that it would be sealed shut. Sighing, she attempted to channel her chakra, but what she got instead was this strange energy that she couldn't seem to control. What? This isn't chakra, she said out loud to herself, noticing that different feel that the energy had. For starters, it wasn't blue or red, instead being an earthy brown color. It also didn't have the same consistency of chakra, appearing far more gaseous. She could barely control it either almost like it actually didn't belong to her. At least, that was the way that it felt. She lifted her arm lightly, taking note of the bracelet that seemed to be bonded on her wrist. She tried to use her new, whatever it was to increase her strength and pry off the bracelet, but there was no way that happened. She also didn't seem to be able to use any jutsu as well. Well, if that was the case, then there really was no way they could escape this place without any chakra. A few of the shinobi and the tougher villagers seemed to be coming to write about now, and they shook their heads in confusion at where they were. Fortunately, only a few of them had a panic attack, and those that did work themselves towards exhaustion banging their fists on the wall. However, the majority of them either remained calm or realized the hopelessness of that action. They seemed to break off into groups, going to sit with their friends who had woken, and it was then Kanahaji realized that all of her friends were still slumbering peacefully so she was all alone for the time being. No, that wasn't true, she had her comrades in the village, but they were simply cattle for the creatures that had taken them at the moment. When they came back, she didn't know, but it would be soon. She could feel it. More and more people were beginning to awaken, but she was cut from her musings when there came a rustling of the tumblers, and the thick metal door opposite her creaked open slowly, much too slowly for her to be comfortable. Hello, my pathetic little villagers. Are you ready for the worst day of your life? Came a loud, obnoxious voice, the same one that had tormented her during the invasion of the village. 
Now angry, she turned her raging face towards the familiar blonde-haired visage, his smug smirk and vicious attitude leaving a bitter taste in her mouth. She couldn't use her chakra now, but she'd be damned if she didn't make this monster pay for his crimes. Against her better judgment, she screamed violently and pounced at Naruto, who was flanked by five humanoid beings much like him. They were different than most of the creatures that invaded the village, but one couldn't exactly call their appearance human. She screamed herself hoarse with a primal shriek, ready to wipe the grin off Naruto's face. The humanoid beings around Naruto tensed and prepared to attack, but Naruto held them in place. Before she could even react, Naruto casually pulled his right hand out of his pocket and backhanded her cleanly across the cheek, knocking out two of her teeth and sending her flying back several feet. The abused girl lay there pathetically, coughing up her molars and a thick globule of crimson blood. The villagers seemed to be roused by the display of rebellion, but they didn't dare attack the leader. Kanahaji choked on her own blood, coughing it up lightly as it poured from her throat. That was no ordinary slap, there was something behind it that made it more powerful. She couldn't take it, tears poured from her eyes. He was simply humiliating her, slapping her around and not even giving her the time of day. She heard him laugh, that infernal cackle that she was convinced was pure evil. It haunted her, and she hugged herself tightly after getting to her feet. The monster laughed again, and she shivered as she registered what was going on. Ha! Don't you worry, you filthy little whore. You'll get your time to shine soon enough. But right now, it's time for your village's debut, and we don't want to be late. He turned around and called into the hall. It was a haunting shriek that set the villagers on edge, but they wouldn't have to worry about that for long. Everyone. Escort the villagers to the bottom sublevel of the institution. If they resist you in any way, you have permission to knock them out. Sail and the others are waiting for you with the guinea pigs, so get going. He ordered, as a few hundred hollows swarmed into the room and began plucking villagers, both conscious and unconscious onto their backs. And, as for you, he trailed off, thundering over to where Kanahaji lay. He hoisted her up by the wrist, holding her at arm's length as he stared into her eyes intently. You've pissed me off more than enough. You'll have a very special purpose in this little event, one that's a great honor, he drawled, before he noticed the tears running down the girl's face. Oh, you're crying. How pathetic, don't you have any willpower? Kanahaji's lip trembled from the internal torment she was going through. What the fuck did he know? H. How, she sniffled. H. How can you be so depraved? Me. The village. Kanoha. What did we ever do to you? To any of you? Why are you doing this? She croaked, her voice hoarse and her throat bleeding. The blood dribbled down her chin and hit the floor in front of her, but no one paid it any mind. Naruto seemed to contemplate this for a moment, before he focused his chin towards his face with his free hand. He sneered at her, showing a row of serrated teeth. Kanahaji tried to look away but his hand was forcing her to look at him. Oh, you want to know why I'm doing this, hmm? Okay, I'll tell you. He trailed off for a moment before he came up with an answer. He moved his face toward hers, smirking lazily through half-lidded eyes. I could go off on some dramatic sob story of my life and how Kanoha hated me, but I'm not going to. Honestly, no matter how much I hate you and your village, the reasons behind this seem rather petty after two centuries. But still, I can't help but loathe you. I long for the day when I see your village dead, but that reason, it doesn't matter. All that matters is that I get my way. Your lives don't hold any importance to me. I will get my way no matter what, and you know why, it's because I have power. You can say all you want about morality and how you don't deserve this treatment, but I don't care. I have the power to make each and every one of your lives miserable. And that's exactly what I'm going to do. I can do whatever I want without any consequences. And you, he paused, tightening his grip on Kanahaji's wrist. Her bones snapped underneath the pressure in a sickening crunch. Kanahaji cried out in pain as Naruto prolonged the process, squeezing even after her wrist had broken. He leaned in, placing his lips upon her ear like he was kissing it softly. And you, you can't do anything about that, he whispered, her mouth as close as it could be to her ear. As his rancid breath and words entered her ear canal, 
Kanahaji failed to suppress a shiver then ran down her spine. But that's enough about that for now. We're going to be late for the show at this rate. Come with me, and I'll show you your seat, he hissed, as he forcibly dragged the girl out of the room by the hair as the last of the villagers were corralled away. W what I is, t this, p place. Kanahaji croaked out through her hoarse throat, the bloody chafing of it leaving her voice sounding gravelly and distorted. After ten agonizing minutes of being dragged around by the hair, Naruto had deposited her roughly into a strangely comfortable chair on a balcony overlooking an extraordinarily wide room on the bottom sublevel of the institution. It was a strange room, to be honest. On the bottom level of the room, below where she was currently sitting, a manner of scientific equipment rested. There were all sort of gauges, test tubes, monitors, operating tables, drills, shark tools, chemicals, and villagers. In a panic, Kanahaji turned her attention to the swathing mass of hollows the depositing villagers all over the room. Some lucky ones were placed on the operating tables, but the leftovers were simply placed on the floor. However, Kanahaji had the horrible urge that they would not be neglected. Kanahaji flung herself to her feet, but as soon as she did so, shackles burst forth from the chair, pinning her arms, legs, and torso to it. With her movements prevented, Naruto loomed over the defenseless girl, grinning wildly, before he placed his hands on her shoulders and whispered into her ear. You are a very special case, and for that I'm going to leave you out of the experimentation. Instead, you get to watch as the villagers and friends are warped into creatures beyond your imagination. He hissed cruelly, drawing more tears from the girl. He sat on the chair to the left of her, which was significantly more ornate than hers. Several dozen lab-coated hollow and Aaron Carr came bursting through the door, lead by Naruto's head scientist's sail. They lined up in two single-file lines, their stoic coordination out of place with the eager look on Sail's face. They sauntered into the room, relieving the non-scientist hollows of their duties while they scrutinized their latest subjects, the villagers of Kanoha. There seemed to be about five villagers to every one scientist, and it was more than enough considering the scientist's competency. Sayo looked at his king expectantly, waiting patiently for the okay. Naruto nodded excitedly, the toothy grin no longer containable on his face. He hopped to his feet, holding his arms out in front of him as he let loose an awful cackle of mirth. Kanahaji stared. He leaned over the railing, like he just couldn't this display holding off any longer. He had waited so long for this moment, and it was finally going to be fulfilled. Let the games begin, he roared as the scientists below began their work. It was a horrible sight. The scientists pulled some sort of mechanism from their coats, and from what Kanahaji could see at this distance, they were tinkering with a few dials and buttons on the thing. Within a few seconds of the action, one of the villagers for each individual scientist sprung to their feet, instantly awake and fully conscious. Before they could even panic, they were grabbed roughly by the scientists and hoisted onto an operating table while being strapped down at every angle. There was absolutely no way that they could move now. Kanahaji tried desperately to move, to free herself from her confines as she focused in on an ordinary man, a civilian from the looks of it, who was being strapped down to the operating table nearest to them. Naruto reached out and grabbed her wrist, halting her movements. Shoo! Sure. Don't spoil the fun, this is the best part, he said giddily, as if a prime show was about to begin. Despite having been slapped, Kanahaji continued to writhe in her seat. She shut her eyes, trying to avert her gaze as the horrible actions took place. However, the moment she did so, she felt a nasty electric shock surge through her spine, forcing her eyes open. Another shackle emerged from the chair, holding her neck in place out towards the scene. Two smaller limbs emerged from the chair after that and rested on her eyelids, pulling them open and forcing them in place. Naruto sneered at her, that diabolical laughter that never failed to make her upset. He truly was forcing her to view this entire scene, and was going to make her as miserable as possible throughout the entire ordeal. Now, now, we can't be having that, now can we? I told you that you're going to watch every second of this, and I'm going to make sure I keep my word on that. You are not allowed to shut your eyes or look away. This was degrading. Besides, it could be worse so count yourself lucky. I chose you for this because you're special, 
and I want to see the look of hopelessness and misery on your face. You could have ended up like one of them, he drawled, pointing down towards the floor. She heard a whirring sound, and in her despair she noticed one of the drills on the ceiling revving up while crackling in this mustard yellow energy. It oozed off the tip of the drill, landing directly on the shoulder of the man. She turned away as she heard his screaming, and she didn't want to know what was happening down there. The scientist released the drill from the man with a sickening squelch, retracting it back into its original position. It was now caked in blood, which gave the drill a red and yellow sheen in addition to the energy. When Kanahaji turned her eyes back towards him, her eyes widened in horror as the man's chest cavity now had bright red cones of flesh connecting the hole together. Kanahaji didn't know how or why he was still alive, but he was, and the cones of flesh seemed to be pulsating, burning the tissue around it into a charred black. It definitely didn't look right on his body. At this point, the scientist took a large scalpel and some heavy-duty scissors, and began to work, making careless incisions, slashes, and cuts all over the man's body. He jammed the scalpel into the man's left lung, making him wheeze and vomit up blood. The man looked ready to die, but the scientist wasn't done just yet. The scientist lifted up a flask of this eerily clear glowing liquid, which Naruto recognized as the concentrated essence of Ryoku extracted from one of his hollow soldiers. W. What's he doing now? Kanahaji managed to whimper, as if the drill wasn't enough. Don't you know? That flask he's holding is concentrated essence of hollow Ryoku. It has some rather unpleasant effects on the bodily structure of normal souls, he said darkly. Kanahaji shuddered. The scientist had already started, forcibly opening up the man's mouth and triggering the gag reflex, forcing the liquid down his throat. The substance seemed to have some sort of corrosive property, as the man screamed as if his innards were being scalded by a powerful acid, and it was almost like they were. He screamed some more, and to add insult to injury the scientist was testing him with all kinds of dangerous chemicals and tools as the Kanoha civilian underwent a kind of transformation. It was at that point that the man began thrashing on the table, to the point where the scientist had to hold him down. His body was beginning to change, and Kanahaji didn't like the looks of it. It wasn't going to be anything natural. His scream morphed into an inhuman gurgle, one that made Kanahaji's ears hurt and sent her mind into a torrent of fear. Yet, she couldn't even take her eyes off of him due to the constraints. His skin was the main thing that changed, but unlike what Kanahaji had expected, it seemed that he wasn't changing to become a hollow at all. Rather, it was something alien and different than even these things. The scientist kicked the new creature out of his way, done with him and Kanahaji had a strange urge to help the man. But the scientist had another victim to torment, and Kanahaji's focus was torn from the former man. Wonderful, isn't it? After this is done, they'll all be twisted works of nature. Naruto laughed beside her, but Kanahaji didn't even notice. She was busy taking in the entire display. After taking her focus off him, she realized just how horrible this entire scene was. While she had her focus on just one of the civilians of Kanoha, there were dozens if not hundreds of operations going on each one more horrific than the last in her mind. They all involved drills and sharp tools, and when the villagers weren't being wounded seemingly for the sake of it, they were being horribly experimented on and morphed into these strange creatures. It was like they were guinea pigs or prototypes for something. The scientists simply didn't care if the results were unexpected or if they died in the process. The sounds of screaming coming from mouths other than the man's assaulted her ears for the first time as she futilely tried to take in the full scene of what was going on here. Try as she might, she couldn't fully comprehend it. It was far too much for her. For over an entire day, she continued to view these monstrosities warp and torment the villagers, doing whatever it took to make sure they were in as much pain as possible. She witnessed several of her friends undergo the process, but it was something else that managed to completely break her spirit. After she panned her eyes past a bloody chain of five limbless humanoids, she came across a sight that struck her the most horrifically. She knew that posture from anywhere, despite the fact that his former body was no longer with us. More tears welled up in her eyes, and she bit her lip to prevent herself from screaming, but to no avail. She would have raised a trembling hand to point at him, but she was currently bound. No. 
Shimura Daisuki, the seventeenth Hokage, had been turned into one of these vile creatures by this monster. As the Hokage, he remained silent the whole time, despite being awake for the whole procedure. Only his eyes, which shone nothing but pure emotional pain betrayed his true emotions. And only when the procedure finally finished after what seemed like forever, was he unrecognizable from the handsome man that he was before. A lot of scales, skin, and muscles have been carved away, revealing several of his bones to the world to behold. No! Kanahaji shrieked, tears pouring down her face. The warped villagers of Kanoha turned to look at her for a split second, before they went back to wallowing in their misery. She turned to Naruto, who had gotten up from his seat to stand up, leaning over the railing as he drunk in all their misery, moaning as their miserable wails and cries filled his ears. Oh yeah! That stuff's the best, he breathed, before he set his eyes on the newest abomination. Kanahaji's father. Look at that new one, he really is quite the ugly one, isn't he? I wonder, what did he go through to make him look like that? He mocked to himself, before looking back at Daisuke. But listen to the way he just lays there. He's not even giving me anything to work with, no screams or anything. It's really quite pathetic. A fallen dog really should bark a little bit more, he said to her. Kanahaji balked at the display of mind screwery that was going on display here. She wasn't even angry at the Arankar anymore, rather, she was now just disturbed beyond belief. H. How, Sikud, why you? She mewled, barely loud enough for Naruto to hear, though it was enough indication to him that her spirit had broken. She no longer had the power to resist. Naruto contemplated that sentence for a second. Hmm, this again? I told you before, I have no regard for the well-being of you or anyone else in your village. I just want to see you in misery, and that involves you as well. I'll tell you, you were a lot like me when I was your age. He trailed off dreamily as if he were remembering better times. And it sickened me. That's why I wanted to crush your spirit, little by little, personally. Until there was absolutely nothing left, no will or hope to live. And by the looks of your father over there, it seems I've achieved that goal, he cackled. Kanahaji didn't understand how anyone could have that big of a grudge. She wanted to say something, to scream at him in anger, but she couldn't even muster up any words. In fact, I've had just about enough of tormenting you, so I think it's time to bring this to an end. So, say goodbye to your shitty life, you fucking cunt, he sneered, roughly grabbing and tearing clean through the shackles. He pushed her forward into the rail, the impact causing her forehead to begin bleeding. He then kicked her straight across the ass, sending her flying cleaning into the bottom sublevel in front of them. She landed with a thud, grunting as she came to a halt in front of a few writhing villagers. She gasped at the first close contact that she had with any of them, seeing how repulsive they were close up. She held her arms up in front of her head, whimpering lightly as a human covered in sores and puncture wounds walked up to her, in too much pain to think clearly. No! Get away, she screamed. These things, they weren't the villagers that she had loved any longer. No. He had made sure they weren't human anymore. Her father noticed her as well and he pathetically tried to scramble over to her. It seemed that the villagers still recognized themselves, which somehow made the situation even more disconcerting to Kanahaji. Daddy, you don't have to push yourself to get to me, she thought to herself, as she saw her warped father suffer more just to get over to her. He likely couldn't speak anymore, and Kanahaji felt a slight shame when she realized she didn't want him near her. She heard the laugh again, the despicable laugh that she just couldn't take the laugh that made her fall into despair. Why was he tormenting them like this? She never got an answer to that question, and she didn't know what he had planned for them next. What she did know was that every single villager and shinobi had been turned into some kind of monstrosity by the scientists. But they were still alive. There could be a way to undo this yet. However, with the one who ordered this overseeing them, there would be no chance to find out. Amidst all the moaning and groaning of the former villagers, Naruto spoke. You probably can't even comprehend speech at this point, but I'm going to give this a go anyway. I hope you're adjusting well to your new forms, my little humans, because things are about to get even worse for you. You have thirty minutes to mull over your pathetic lives down there, before my guards there will escort you to the arena. He said darkly, 
and Kanahaji shuddered. Arena, what is he talking about? To tell the truth, all this talk about the arena wasn't what Kanahaji was particularly worried about. It was the fact that he just said that things were going to be even worse for them. How that was possible, Kanahaji didn't know. But she wasn't particularly eager to find out. I'll see you all there, and I'm looking forward to a great show. Starring you, of course. Naruto drawled, pointing down directly at her. He breathed heavily, allowing the heavy scent of chemicals, blood, and pus waft over his nostrils. This smell had made Kanahaji gag during the entire process, and yet he was loving it. He sighed wistfully, his demeanor significantly improved since the invasion of Kanoha. He took his leave on the flight of stairs directly behind the chairs where they both had sat, and Kanahaji was left alone with her warped villagers.